Dr. Zahir Wahab. Uh, he grew up in Afghanistan and now teaches at Lewis and Clark College. As I'm sure many of you know, he's a great resource right here in Portland. Uh, he was the first person in his family to attend the village school and receive scholarships to study in Lebanon and the United States. And thus far, he is the only Afghan to ever receive a PhD from Stanford University. Uh, just uh, this month, he returned from his 14th trip to Afghanistan since the U.S. invasion in 2001. Uh, he has served as a senior advisor to the Minister of Higher Education in Afghanistan and as a visiting researcher, professor, and a master's degree program for teacher education. And he's been profiled in the Stanford Magazine, the Portland Alliance, the Oregonian, the Lake Oswego Review, and Lewis and Clark's The Chronicle Magazine for his achievements and his services in the United States and Afghanistan. Please welcome Dr. Zahir Wahab. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca, for your wonderful work on behalf of peace, justice, and democracy. And it's wonderful to be sharing the podium with uh, our good friend, speaker, guest, uh, Matt. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's very strange to be uh, talking about this issue because here I am uh, caught between uh, two countries. Uh, my adopted country, uh, the most powerful, the richest country in the world, uh, waging war on uh, uh, my country of origin, uh, the poorest, least developed country uh, in the world, a country that really had nothing to do with 9-11 or um, has no intention of hurting the United States uh, in any way. So it's, it's, it's rather uncomfortable. As pointed out, uh, I just returned. I'm still recovering from all kinds of lags, and if I sound a little mad and angry, I hope you will understand. Um, if you were there, you would be angry too. I want to make a few quick points and then we will develop these points in our uh, discussion. First, I think it was absolutely wrong for the United States to attack and invade Afghanistan because Afghanistan as such had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, a study was done about six months ago or so by an organization called the International Council on Security and Development, and they had huge pictures of the towers collapsing, and they showed these pictures to men in Helmand and Kandahar, to countless men, asking them if they recognized the pictures, and the people had no idea what the pictures were about, which is to say that most Afghans still don't see the connection between them being occupied and what happened, the tragedy and the crime that happened on 9-11. Also, you may remember that uh, just before the uh, October invasion by the United States and its allies, the Taliban tried very hard to work something out with the United States government. This is all a matter of record now, but Washington would not um, have anything to do with that. There was also at the time real tension between the Taliban and the Qaeda leadership. In fact, Osama bin Laden was out or under house arrest at the time of the 9-11. Uh, so. Um, I think it's important for people to know that, that there was really no connection. In fact, people now think that the Taliban had no idea that the Qaeda had a plan to attack um, the United States. Uh, but also the Taliban, uh, and now the insurgency, keeps saying that uh, they have nothing against the United States. They have nothing against the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. people, or, uh, uh, you know, the country. And they keep saying that they have no agenda beyond their own freedom of their own country. So I think that needs to be understood. So we had an attack in October 2001, and now we're witnessing a prolonged occupation. That's what, how it's seen. President Karzai said so, our man in Kabul, but also if you talk to the ordinary Afghans, they would say that this is an occupation by NATO in the United States. And also, as we know, uh, as Matt pointed out, uh, President Obama, in his very disingenuous, dishonest, distorting speech, uh, at the same time, his delegation was pressuring the Karzai government in Kabul to sign a long-term strategic pact with the United States, which would enable the United States to have permanent bases in Afghanistan. That work is underway. And there's clear evidence that the United States and its allies are trying to develop the different bases in Bagram, in Kabul, in Kandahar, in Shindan, in Jalalabad for permanent bases in the United States. 
because as I would submit to you, the United States has a deeper, larger, broader agenda. It's not fighting the Taliban or terrorism or liberating Afghan women. Uh, there is a coalition, that is to say, it, Eisenhower called it the military industrial coalition. We now call it the military industrial intelligence, terrorism, media, war profiteers coalition. <laughs> so there's a, there's a very big coalition and it's global and they want this to continue because there are billions of dollars to be made, including people from Portland. Um, and as Matt pointed out, I think what President Obama is doing, unfortunately, uh, is simply escalate the war, deepen it, expand it, and destabilize the whole region. So I appreciate what Senator Merkley and his staff are doing. They're wonderful. But I think Senator Merkley and other people need to pressure the White House even more and put pressure on the Pentagon and the intelligence community to end this occupation as quickly as possible. Again, a study was done just about a month ago by the same think tank, the International Council on Security and Development, asking men both in the north and in the south of Afghanistan, it's difficult to do surveys on women, but asking them if, uh, if the NATO US presence was harmful or useful to the Afghan people. The vast majority of the people who responded, uh, men north and south, uh, said the US NATO presence is harmful and detrimental to the people of Afghanistan. Most Afghans want the troop out. Most Americans want the troop out. More than half of Congress want the troop out, and they want the war ended. And if we had a genuine democracy and not suffering from a democracy deficit, as Chomsky would say, that's what the government should be doing. So as I said, President Obama's 13-minute speech about a war which has cost half a trillion dollars. Right now, we're spending $10 billion a, a month on the operation in Afghanistan. This is just the United States. There are 46 other countries that also have troops. So you can imagine how much money is being spent. It's estimated that the United States spends a million dollars a year to keep one soldier in Afghanistan. So if we brought 13 soldiers back to the United States, that would be the budget for my graduate school at Lewis Carr College for a year. Uh, and $10 billion a month is essentially what Oregon spends on all of its education system. It's two-thirds of our state budget. So that gives you an idea. So President Obama talking about a war that has gone on for, you know, 10 years with, with countless casualties on both sides, people maimed, people killed, more than 40,000 Afghans perhaps killed, and we will never know the indirect um, cost of the war. And he talks about, you know, seeing the light end of the tunnel, mission accomplished, and so forth. I thought it was an insult to the American intelligence. And people should remember that come election next year. So we have this war turned into an occupation. The occupation has been a catastrophe. I have been going back every year for the last 10 years. I speak both of the languages. I lived in a house with no plumbing whatsoever. I didn't live in one of the foreign ghettos. Now I live in one of the guest houses. So I talk to people. I could go places. I talk to people. I hear conversations. You know, I listen to, to, to people, and I, I hear things. And this is what you see if you were to go to Afghanistan now. There has been very little development taking place, economic development taking place. The economic development that is taking place is what is called maldevelopment, and it's also what is called dependent development. We can develop these ideas later on if you want to. The country has been thoroughly corrupted. Its political system, its culture, its institutions, its army, its police, its intelligence, its branches of the government, it has been thoroughly corrupted, I think, beyond repair. And this corruption is because of the occupation. The country has been gangsterized, where there are no values, there are no norms, anything goes. People disappear in the middle of the day. People get abducted. You get your property taken. You get your house occupied. You get your sister or your wife of your son kidnapped and then asking you for ransom or they just disappear. It's just incredible to see the criminalization and the gangsterization of this society that I don't remember as a child uh, when I was uh, living there. The Afghan women have not been liberated. It is true that maybe two or three percent of the women in the cities have been, quote, liberated, which is to say they can go to school, to universities, they can go to work, they can go shopping. But perhaps 95, 96 percent of the women in Afghanistan still live the same way when they did under the Taliban. 
still live the same way when they did in the Middle Ages. There has been no change in the status of women. In fact, maybe a week ago, some of you listened to this or heard this, uh, a UN report issued said Afghanistan was the worst and the most dangerous country for women in the world. UNICEF says it's the worst place for children in the world. And this is 10 years after the United States in half a trillion dollars and maybe 40,000 plus Afghans killed. So conditions are not, not. And we have put in place essentially a mafiocracy, a kleptocracy. The, the, the government that the United States put together, the constitution that the United States put together and was imposed on the Afghans has no credibility and has no legitimacy. And you get a sense like there is no government. Whatever development there is, is actually private development. Very little is being done by the, uh, by the government. The drugs issue, which was one of the original reasons, remember there were some reasons given by the Operation Enduring Freedom, drugs are, have exploded. So drugs are now between a third and half of the GDP. And more than one and a half million Afghans have been addicted. It's the major producer of heroin in the world and has created a major problem that can never be solved because the government has no ability really to treat uh, these people who are being addicted. They talk about developing the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. That is a lie. It's an absolute lie, and we're spending about 10 to $11 billion a year, quote, developing the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. They are simply militias. They are simply sectarian, ethnic, racial militias, and there are very few Pashtuns in the Afghan army or the national police, maybe 3 or 4 percent. So as soon as the United States is out, just expect uh, some kind of a major confrontation between the army itself or in the different segments of the army. The United States presence has allowed ethnic, sectarian, religious differences to fester. Not only that, but actually it has exacerbated the ethnic relationships in that it will pay this group to control that group. It will pay this village to control that village. It will pay this sectarian group or ethnic group to control and dominate the other group. When the United States leaves, these people will have to sell and deal with these, these differences. Not only has there not been an attempt actually to reconcile the different groups, but there has been every attempt to exacerbate the, the conflict between the different groups. Um, and it is uh, a civil war. Uh, as Matt pointed out in, earlier, in, uh, what was happening in Afghanistan was a civil war underway between the North and the South, between the Pashtuns and the other groups. And the United States simply intervened on behalf of the Northern Alliance against the Pashtuns. That civil war continues, and there's a danger of it erupting any time now. If you go to Afghanistan now, you see massive violence, um, and there's insecurity, there's lawlessness all over the country. More than half a million Afghans have been displaced internally, not just people who are leaving the country. So, as I said, surveys indicate most Americans, most Afghans want the war ended. And also, as pointed out, not only is this a stalemate, in my opinion, but the war is lost. I, I have to give you this news, that the Taliban have won. And it's not just Taliban, it's wrong now to say it's Taliban. It's now a national liberation insurgency, which includes all kinds of people, not just the Pashtuns and not just the Taliban because there's trouble in the north, way up north, where there are very few Pashtuns. There's trouble in the south, east, west, and estimates show that 70% of the land is controlled by the, by the insurgency. And the insurgency has penetrated all organs of the government. As you saw the attack on the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel, I drove by that every day. Uh, they had people, they had actually people staying in the hotel. Uh, that's how the insurgency works, because the insurgency has penetrated all organs of the, uh, the state. Um, let's see. And the other reason that was given originally was that uh, to stabilize the whole region. I submit to you that the invasion and the occupation have in fact caused massive destabilization in Afghanistan, but also in the whole region, in South Asia and Central Asia. Because as long as the U.S. and NATO are there, India and Pakistan will continue to fight, engage, wage the proxy war in Afghanistan. Iran will continue to meddle in Afghan affairs. The Central Asian countries will continue to meddle in Afghan affairs. Saudi Arabia will continue to get involved in Afghan affairs. 
So not only has it not stabilized the situation, but in fact it has destabilized the situation. The war continues because, as I said, there are strong, powerful lobbies like Blackwater, DynCorp, uh, Triple Canopy, other c companies, for example, other construction companies, you know, the, the people who make the drones in Bend. Uh, so there are a lot of people, Americans, Afghans, and Afghan Americans who want to continue this war because there's a lot of money to be made and people have gotten very, very rich. Um, the drug cartel, of course, obviously is interested in continuing uh, the war. Um, and so are some other people. Uh, so very briefly, the reasons we're given are not the reasons. We're not being told the truth. And as I said, we are being insulted. Our intelligence, our integrity, I think, are being insulted by the people uh, who are in charge, the warlords uh, in Washington. The real reasons are, and very few people talk about that, the pipelines, the oil and gas in Central Asia. The real reasons are the minerals in Afghanistan, especially, and also in Central Asia. The real reason is that there has to be a reason to keep NATO together. If there were no reasons, no wars being waged, NATO will collapse, it will fall apart. The real reason is that the United States and NATO are in stiff competition with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which many of you know, or some of you know about that, because, because the Shanghai Cooperation Organization does not want the United States or the West to be encroaching uh, on the Soviet sphere or the Chinese or the Indian or the, the Iranians. Um, and the real reason is to maintain, establish and maintain U.S. hegemony in South and Central uh, Asia. Um, there's competition, economic competition with China, of course, China has the biggest contract, commercial contract with the Afghan government, the Ainak copper mine, four and a half billion dollars. Uh, but not to worry, because JP Morgan also has a contract. They're prospecting for gold in Badakhshan. So JP Morgan is involved right now uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, so I think the, the thing is that uh, to, to know what the real reasons are, and what I worry about is, uh, this resurgence of the civil war.